allow me to come and, and talk for a few minutes this afternoon. I'll tell you um, a fun fact about me. I actually have 14 children at home, so medical device security is nothing compared to 14 kids, especially when two of them are teenage boys, and they will, you know, in terms of electronics and games and hacking, they'll keep you on your toes. So a little bit about... Um, medical devices this afternoon. Real quick, I'll try not to bore you guys, but this is an interesting topic. Um, you know, the, the medical device uh, care and feeding back at our health system is done by our biomedical engineering group. And they will tell you, and I will tell you, that they are woefully understaffed. And I think there is a, a effort and a recognition of that fact. And there's definitely going to be a lot more resources put towards the cybersecurity um, recognition of medical devices in our environment on a go-forward basis. So I'm looking forward to, to what the future holds. So let's see um, the definition of, of what the FDA calls a medical device. An instrument, apparatus, implement, machine, contrivance, implant, in vitro reagent, or other similar or related article, including a component, part, or accessory, which is recognized in the official natural formulary or the United States Pharmacopeia or any supplement to them, intended for use in the diagnosis of disease or other conditions, or in the care, uh, cure, mitigation, treatment, or prevention of disease in man or other animals, or intended to affect the structure or any function of the body of man or other animals and which does not achieve its primary intended purposes through chemical action within or on the body of man or other animals and which is not dependent upon being metabolized for the achievement of any of its primary intended purposes. And so from the FDA website, you know, medical devices range from simple tongue depressors and bedpans to complex programmable pacemakers with microchip technology and, and laser surgical devices. If a product is labeled, promoted, or used in a manner that meets the following definition in Section 201H of the Federal Food and Drug Co and Cosmetic Act, it will be regulated by the FDA as a medical device and is subject to pre-marketing and post-marketing regulatory controls. So not getting into the breakdown of the FDA classes. You guys probably know there's class one, two, and three devices. And as you progress through the classes, there's different requirements, more stringent requirements from the FDA as you go up the class level. So let's kind of talk about some of the hacking that's happened with medical devices in the past. In 2008, we saw Kevin Fu demonstrate a pacemaker hack. And if you guys don't know about that or didn't read about it, it's basically, um, he was able to program it and, and shut it down basically, or to have it deliver an electrical charge to the patient that could be lethal. And so that is rather significant. Um, he also was able to glean personal patient data from the device just by sniffing the traffic that was coming from it and eavesdropping on that. In 2011, uh, Jerome Radcliffe at the Black Hat Conference demonstrated an insulin pump hack. 2013, we had vulnerabilities that were discovered in a wide range of devices, including surgical and anesthesia devices, ventilators, infusion pumps, defibrillators, patient monitors, and lab equipment. And that was from Billy Rios. In 2014, we had multiple alerts that came out from government agencies about uh, medical device issues, including ICS CERT and uh, the FBI and FDA and, and Homeland Security as well. In 2015, we had TRAPEX and Protivity that demonstrated uh, medical devices were actively being exploited by cyber criminals as entry points into hospitals. And then in 2014 and also 2016, we saw the FDA cybersecurity guidance for pre-market submission and post-market management released. And those are some requirements that I'm gonna talk more about here in a few minutes. And then of course, this year, you guys all know what happened with WannaCry and the health systems that were shut down in Great Britain. Um, 
very significant issues going on in terms of that. So some of the challenges that we face, one of the biggest ones is, is asset management. The sheer volume of devices that we have, which is north of 30,000, not all connected to the network, I have you. Um, but the, the numerous issues around tracking these devices is, is difficult, mainly because they're so small and mobile. And so you can imagine how, how difficult it is to, to have a good handle on asset management when it comes to these devices. And I'm going to show in a few minutes some of the ways we're, we're trying to um, resolve that issue. Updates from vendors on vulnerabilities have been difficult. So we're, we are a member of the NHISAC, and part of the NHISAC is a medical device listserv, which my team uh, monitors and gets regular updates that are, that are coming out to that listserv about vulnerabilities and issues that are talked about. Um, our biomed engineering group is a, a member of another listserv from a group called ECRI. And then we really need to have vendors work on proper SDLC in terms of developing their applications so that when they develop apps that are medical devices, they do it in a proper way that's not going to require a user to be running on the machine with admin rights. And that's a, a desktop management issue, if you will, but it's definitely one that we see on medical devices as well. And vendors are historically, now they're getting better, but historically, uh, not very focused on security risks when it comes to medical devices. So if there's an FDA certification involved, it's very expensive to get that device recertified. And so I think the, the cost of that is one of the, the driving factors that, that drives these vendors not to want to go through the recertification process. But, you know, there was also rumors that if it's, if it's an FDA certified device that you can't patch it. Well, that's, that's not exactly true. Um, but we know in the past that they have prevented patching of systems that are FDA certified. So that's been a problem for us. And then vendors often will dictate if they need to access your network in order to support that device, they'll often dictate the method that the remote access is going to, to occur. So if you don't play by their rules, then you don't get to be a part of the game which is you know, difficult for us if they're the only vendor in the, in the space that provides that. So we have to negotiate those things with vendors. Some additional challenges, you know, getting them to assess the risks around their devices. Um, I've been, just as an example, I've been back and forth um, over the last few weeks with two different vendors over contracts uh, because as the contracts come across my desk and I get to review them, I start asking questions. We actually have a security questionnaire that we send to all our vendors that does sort of a risk assessment on the, on the vendor and the application. But in talking to the vendors, you know, a lot of them will tell you that they've got an FDA certification on their device, but we don't really care about security on our corporate network. We're not really gonna care about patch management. We're not gonna do vulnerability scanning, we're not gonna do penetration testing. We don't really care about security on our corporate network, but our, our device is FDA certified, so you can trust us. We're all good. So that, that, that gives me a lot of consternation and um, had, had some difficult conversations in the last few weeks with vendors about, I mean, if your software development is going on at, at your corporate office and you don't really care about security there, and a hacker gets onto your network, I mean, how difficult is it gonna be for them to implant a backdoor or some malicious code in that application that's then gonna end up on my network? So it's a difficult, difficult conversation and I'm, I'm trying to spur these guys, these guys on to uh, ever increasing usefulness around that. Um, getting them to manufacture devices that can be updated without chip replacement is a challenge. Vulnerability testing of production devices is not favorable. And when I, when I talk about this testing, I'm talking about in my environment. So if I've already got a medical device that's in production 
it's, it's not only risky for me to, to do a Vuln scan against that device, especially if it's attached to a patient, but you know, trying to find the test equipment to do it in an offline manner is also challenging. So you can see how vulnerability testing of these devices is, is a challenge. Um, wireless devices present challenges because you can't create a VLAN that for a device that's gonna run between multiple buildings and you're gonna mix the risk levels. You're gonna have something that needs to be really secure mixed in with something that roams over to a, a user VLAN where it's a very unsecure or not as secure uh, network segment. So med uh, wireless devices present a challenge. Wireless radios in these devices are not nearly as strong as you might find in a laptop, so getting them to, to connect is often challenging. Telemetry devices you know, supposed to be a protected band that these devices use, but often we see that there's overlap and this causes interference with some of our telemetry devices because of that overlap where it's supposed to be a protected band, so we have, we have issues around that. Updates to devices can be very manual. Um, just for example, a, a, a vital sign monitor. Um, you have to download the update, test it on a test device, find production devices to update when they're not in use, and then manually transfer the update. So you can see how labor intensive it is for a device like that to actually be updated. It takes a long time when you have hundreds. Uh, different firmware versions on the same model device can cause software issues. So if you've got the same make and model of, of a device in two different instances and it's running, they're, they're running the same software version but different firmware versions, that can cause issues. And so these, these questionnaires that I mentioned earlier that we send out, it's like a paper risk assessment, basically. Um, I, I would refer to it as a non-technical assessment. But they reveal such issues that we found on some of these devices, like default passwords, uh, the need for proper sanitization or disposal of the old devices, um, the need for unique user accounts. Some of them don't support that. And then the need for session timeouts and then also password complexity. These are some of the sort of non-technical things that we see. So we've got a, a number of agencies that are trying to help in this area. I um, want to cover some of that real quick so you guys can see what, what resources are out there for you all if you happen to be in this industry. The NCCOE is the National Cybersecurity Center of Excellence. And um, they released a draft of the NIST Cybersecurity Practice Guide on securing wireless infusion pumps in the healthcare delivery organizations on, on May 8th of this year. Um, the ECRI Institute I mentioned earlier is one of the uh, listservs. They also have a, a medical device safety report. You can get that from, from their website. Um, the FDA released final guidance on the post-market management of cybersecurity and medical devices. And this is something I, I mentioned earlier. You know, this, this guidance recommends that manufacturers actively participate in an information sharing and analysis organization, such as the NHISAC, which I mentioned that we, we are a member of. Active participation includes sharing vulnerability information with the ISAL and having un, uh, documented processes for assessing and responding to vulnerability and threat intelligence information received from the ISAL. So that's a big help to us. The third thing is they've got a fact sheet that talks about patching of these medical devices. And I, and I mentioned earlier um, how th there was a, a myth going around that you could never patch a medical device because it would, it would fall out of compliance with the FDA. Well, this is from their fact sheet right here. It says medical device manufacturers can always update a medical device for cybersecurity. In fact, the FDA does not typically need to review changes made to medical devices solely to strengthen cybersecurity. So that's straight from, from the FDA. So that's, that's good to know. 
Recently, there's been a memorandum of understanding between the FDA, the NHISAC, and an organization called MDIS, M-D-I-S-S, is the Medical Device Innovation Safety and Security Consortium. Um, this collaboration is encouraging the, the sharing of cybersecurity vulnerabilities. Um, it's helping to de develop an awareness of framework for improving critical infrastructure, cybersecurity, and then it's encouraging innovative strategies to assess and mitigate vulnerabilities that affect their products. And I'll talk about how they're doing that in the next few slides. Um, the, the one at the top of the list is something called MD Viper. Stands for Medical Device Vulnerability Intelligence Program for Evaluation and Response. So MD Viper is going to support FDA's post-market guidance. It's going to provide medical device vulnerability sharing, which I talked about. It's going to create an open community of medical device cybersecurity stakeholders. It's promoting a consensus and consistency of vulnerability reporting and information sharing approach and process. And then contribute significantly to medical device cybersecurity education. And then number six, it's going to foster situational awareness of medical device cybersecurity threats, best practices, and mitigation strategies. And that, that last bullet leads into the next slide, which talks about this National Cybersecurity Safety and Surveillance Network. So there's three components to it. It's the MD RAP, the MD SATI, and the MD VISI. And you can see what those, those acronyms stand for. Basically, the MD RAP is going to give us standardized risk assessments, a platform for multiple methodologies, data collection, scoring, and reporting, and then crowdsourced data sharing. The MD SATI, which is more about surveillance and threat intelligence, is going to collect malware and intrusion experience. It's going to have incident alerts and it's gonna have a threat indicator information. The MD Visi is gonna give us real-time requirements for manufacturers. It's gonna collect device and model vulnerabilities. It's gonna incorporate data from the National Vulnerability Database. So those three things you can see from those uh, surveillance, uh, cybersecurity safety and surveillance network are really gonna be beneficial for us to move forward in this discussion that we're having today on medical device security. Something else that's just been released this month, uh, June 2017, there was a task force commissioned. It was called the Healthcare Industry Cybersecurity Task Force. Um, 21 individuals on this task force from multiple verticals uh, including HHS, so the government's involved in this as well, but a lot of private industry folks are on this task force. So the report on improving cybersecurity came out this month. Um, they have recommendations underneath the imperatives that they came out with. The second imperative in this document is specific to medical devices and, and increasing the security and resilience of those medical devices. And underneath each one of these recommendations that I'm about to list out are many, many action items that organizations can take to help advance the cybersecurity efforts in their organizations. So the first recommendation, secure legacy systems. The second one was improve manufacturing and development transparency among developers and users. Third thing was to increase adoption and rigor of the secure development life cycle in the development of medical devices. Require strong authentication to improve identity and access management for healthcare workers, patients, and medical devices. The fifth one, to employ strategic and architectural approaches to reduce the attack surface for medical devices, EHRs, and the interfaces between these products. The sixth one was to establish a medical computer emergency readiness team 
to coordinate medical device specific responses to cybersecurity incidents and vulnerability disclosures. So you can see how that will be very beneficial, especially the, the action items that are listed under each of those recommendations. And I encourage you guys to go out and look at that document. This is the links there on the bottom. And I'll, I'll share the slides with anybody that wants them. So what are we doing um, in our organization? Obviously, the, the castle strategy is something everybody's familiar with. The big, the big stone structure with the moat around it. Lots of layers of defense. Um, one of the things that I'm doing is really trying to inject myself into the procurement process for our medical devices to make sure that I get to review those contracts as they come through and that we're looking for the, the proper things that we want these vendors to be doing. One of those things is a form called the MDS-2 form. And if you're familiar with medical devices, you might be familiar with this form, but it basically asks the vendor a lot of questions about how they are uh, protecting that device, what controls they've implemented on the device to actually um, allow for the, the proper security controls on the device itself. So I'll show you a sample screenshot of what this form looks like in just a second. Wireless tracking is one thing that we're doing for our devices. We have, um, for, for devices that don't inherently have a wireless radio, we have installed wireless tags on these devices so that we can track them from a triangulation standpoint. Um, the system that we developed is called Fetch. It's a homegrown system that uses the Blink protocol to track those devices. Um, segmentation, obviously, is, is crucial. That, that goes into the Castle strategy I was talking about, but obviously uh, keeping these devices segmented onto a private VLAN or behind a firewall is the, is the most important thing that we can do from a security standpoint initially before we take other steps. Passive vulnerability scanning is something that, that we are about to start. Um, we, we have purchased a device that is going to sit on the network and listen to the traffic as it goes by and look for vulnerabilities. And this, this device is, is really intended for more traditional vulnerabilities. It's not specific to medical devices, but we are um, hoping that we're going to be able to find some issues that, that need to be remediated by sniffing that traffic with this uh, passive scanner. And I'm sure that if we have success with it, our vendor will be instantly asking me to do a case study on how all that works and, and how well it went. So you could hear more about that later. Um, we're doing risk assessments, obviously, of the devices, and that's more, um, like I said, of a, a paper assessment. It's a questionnaire that goes down a list of questions that we ask um, to, to discover you know, how the devices communicate, and, and particularly, we prioritize the devices that, that communicate to the internet or if they're gonna interface with our EMR, with our, our electronic medical record. So we're most definitely going to prioritize those devices on the top of our list to be assessed. And then we're gonna adopt standards. There's a, a, an ISO standard 80001 uh, that specifically relates to medical devices. If you guys haven't seen that before, you can Google that and, and um, search for it and find it easily. And then the last thing is we are uh, considering some options for assessing the various electronic emissions that come from medical devices. So as you can imagine, it's not just wireless that we're talking about, but there's Bluetooth, there's radio signals, there's all different types of emissions that might come from a medical device. And we would like to take steps to evaluate those emissions to see, you know, are they, like we saw in, in the, the last example, are they, are they spitting out uh, passwords and plain text, things like that. We, we want to, to be able to discover those and try to work with the vendors to, to get those resolved. This is the MDS-2 form. Yeah, you probably can't read that, but it, it basically shows you at the top uh, the device model, manufacturer. Um, that's some of the most critical information for me to have from an asset inventory standpoint so that 
I can know at a point in time that we were running version 1.2 of this software code. So when a vulnerability does come out, we've got an inventory to, to bounce that up against to see if we have those devices and, and go from there. Fetch, I mentioned earlier, is uh, the, the wireless device tracking system that we've developed internally. It's a homegrown system. Um, provides real-time tracking for Wi-Fi connected devices on our, our health system networks. And the devices that, that don't have internal uh, wireless radios have these little uh, Wi-Fi tags placed on them so that we can track them. Um, one, of the, one of the benefits of Fetch is that we could have preventative maintenance schedules that, that are maintained in Fetch. And then we, we've got an asset database of track devices with an, a last known location. And so this is an example, a screenshot of Fetch. Um, you can see in the top left corner, we're tracking right now um, devices that are smart pumps. There's a device called a WOW, uh, which is a wireless on wheels. Um, wheelchairs, bladder scanners, and something called a ProPack. Um, and then you can see the first column shows it's online or offline. Then we've got a location, which I blacked out some of that to protect the innocent. Um, a model and a serial number. And then you can see in that fourth column there, it shows the time that we last talked to that device. And so from there, we can actually pinpoint on a map of our organization where those devices are. You can see a little green circle over there on the right-hand side. Uh, this is a broader map of another location um, of the devices that are green and red, which green is online currently. Red means that's the last known location that that device was seen. So if we need to go and try and put hands on it and track it down, this is how we go about doing that. I think that's my last slide. What questions do you guys have? Yes, sir. Well, so we, you know, we've obviously got a wireless network throughout the campus. And so when the device emits a signal to try to attach to a wireless access point, based on where those access points are located, we can triangulate the device. What else? All right, guys. Thanks for your time. I appreciate it.